Hey there, and welcome to this week's edition of Clean Technica's news broadcast. My name is Hanan, I'm your host, and this week, I don't know how it happened, but all the news stories are EV news stories. We originally did have one climate change story. Uh, the US Democrats, they presented their climate change action plan, but that thing is 500 pages long, and unlike the IEA report, does not have any fancy graphs to show you guys. And so basically that, that news story is being pushed next week, but uh, sneak preview, it's appalling. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was not involved in it, and it clearly shows. So, on that note, we might as well start with the one bad EV news story. So, let's get to it. The end of Biden. That one bad news story was regarding Biden. Now, there are a lot of new electric automakers trying to recreate Tesla's success, but so far, few have succeeded. And Biden, they were literally at that last step before having their hard work pay off. Now, Biden, they're well known for their enormous 48-inch screen. They already had the factory built, they were just waiting for final approval from the government. And then COVID-19 struck. There was really no moment where they would have been more vulnerable than they were right now when COVID-19 hit. And you know, unlike other companies like Faraday Future, they didn't have any enormous CEO scandals, enormous funding scandals. They were very promising. Now, back in April, they already had to furlough half of their US employees, but now they announced that they are letting go of all their employees, what is going to be a six month shutdown. And what will happen after that? Well, we'll see. As of right now, the chances of them reopening afterwards are slim, unless some very deep pockets decide to invest heavily. Most are currently unwilling to make large acquisitions. Though in my opinion, this would have been a perfect purchase for a large corporation like Amazon or Apple, or even one of the enormous stagnant automakers, the list of which is not that small. Now, is it only bad timing that has subdued the company or was there something else? You know, personally, I think that the fact that they were so strongly focusing on autonomy, as well as from the very start trying to make vehicles that they can sell outside of China, is partly also to blame here. What will happen after those six months, we don't know, but I'm certainly rooting for them. BYD Tang Norway pre-launch. BYD, they're getting ready to start their first trials in Norway. This week, they had a special pre-launch event in Oslo, starring the new Tang EV. Here is one thing worth noting. Although this is a trial project, I have no doubt that the Tang EV credentials will have enormous appeal to discerning car buyers in Norway and the car will establish itself as a firm favorite. The SUV sector in particular is highly competitive and it is important that the new entrant to the market can offer some USPs. The Blade battery, to name but one outstanding new feature, will appeal very much to a safety conscious public. The company is partnering up in Norway with a company called RSA that will handle all the dealerships as well as all of the services and repairs. In some ways, this represents a strategy very different from what Tesla is doing. And it's actually a good thing because by partnering with other companies within Europe, they will be able to roll out their products and their services throughout Europe a lot more quickly. Tesla, even right now, after years, still hasn't delivered Model 3s to day one reservation owners in multiple countries throughout Europe. Countries that don't have any service centers, any stores, and not even any superchargers. Things that Tesla has been promising for years. BYD might actually be able to catch up with them, which is crazy. Ford Mach E, orders and upgrades. This week, there's also some pretty exciting Ford Mach E news. Anyone who holds a reservation for a Mach E can now place their order, but that is just the beginning. Tesla may have recently learned uh, to underpromise and then deliver more than was promised, but it seems Ford has picked up that trait very quickly as well because this week they announced that their all the Mach E's are getting an increase in power. This little chart here should show the difference. This is quite exciting. Just this week, the Clean Technica staff was talking about the fact that there aren't enough competitors that will accelerate like the Tesla Model 3 Standard Range Plus. Most of the competition takes seven or even 11 seconds to reach 100 uh, kilometers per hour, 60 miles per hour. But with this increase, all four variants will take less than seven seconds and the all wheel drive version might even match Standard Range Plus acceleration. I mean, you would end up paying a price close to the all-wheel drive long-range version to get standard range plus performance, but considering the fact that, according to some estimates, the market is a whole 12 years behind Tesla, this is not bad at all. 
Giga Berlin, plans change. Gigafactory Berlin, there seems to be some very unusual news coming from there this week, but it's actually all not what it seems, it's being misinterpreted by a lot of people. So let me first get to the news and we will later then uh, show exactly what exactly is being misinterpreted here. But basically what is being said is that the factory is being downsized somewhat. It will still produce as many cars as was planned, but battery pack production is being moved away or cancelled. Uh, same goes for the plastic component production. Now it's probably not a coincidence that those are the two main things that also don't take place at the Fremont factory. The battery packs are made in Gigafactory 1, Nevada, and the plastic components are made at the Lathrop facility located between Fremont and Gigafactory 1. This is an image of the new updated plans. The area that the building covers is unchanged, but it will be reduced in height anywhere between 29 to 50 feet. The question is why, and there seem to be two correct answers here, but it really all comes down to just one thing, which is how quickly Tesla can start production. This all depends on permits, and that all depends on approval for permits and what can stand in the way of approval. Now, first of all, water. Uh, these new plants seem to reduce the water requirement by 30%, but the real issue is where the factory is in general, which is Grünheide, and it seems to be an area that suffers from frequent droughts. The people living there, have a fear that the Tesla factory will simply suck them dry completely. Warranted or not, well, that's a different discussion. But the thing is, uh, to get unobstructed approval uh, for these permits, they need to satisfy all stakeholders, and that includes the people living there. Hopefully, these plans will uh, alleviate their fears at least somewhat. Now, it's possible that plastics and battery pack assembly were removed from this phase of the project because they were the most permit-intensive. And that's the key to the whole thing, really. It's not that plastic and uh, battery pack production is being cancelled. It's simply that it's not going to be part of phase one. It's going to be part of phase two, phase three. Who knows? There are still huge buildings that are going to be built. It'll probably be somewhere there. And in general, the size of the factory might increase in total. Though it could also be that the total number of permits needed was too high and would take too long. So they probably had a cold, hard look at what could they do without if they absolutely had to in which case the two things they had the most experience with uh, doing without in the past at Fremont would definitely have been battery production and plastic components. These two are definitely not the most water-intensive part of production because that would be the paint shop. So some mysteries do still remain here, like where will the batteries come from? Now there are a couple of theories here, and the first would be uh, that in the recent new deal that uh, Panasonic and Tesla made about the Gigafactory 1, that it would increase in size which is unconfirmed, by the way, but not impossible. Uh, Giga Factory in Nevada did, by the way, uh, provide the battery packs that Giga Shanghai needed until Giga Shanghai became self-sufficient. Also, since Giga Shanghai is self-sufficient now, it could mean that some of their battery packs will be sent to Berlin. They really wouldn't count on that. But there is one more option, and this is actually a theory of my own. Tesla might temporarily set up a battery factory elsewhere, nearby the actual Giga Factory. You see, just a three-hour drive away from Giga Berlin is a huge LG Chem battery factory just, that just announced two months ago that it will increase production plans from 30 gigawatt hour to 65 gigawatt hour. LG Chem already knows how to make Tesla's 2170 cells. They have the recipe and they are making those batteries for te all the Tesla vehicles currently made in Giga Shanghai. This drive, by the way, is also shorter than the drive from Giga Nevada to Fremont. Is this all a big coincidence? It's more than possible, but this would put less strain on the Roadrunner project. Xpeng P7 starts sales. Xpeng is starting the sales of its P7 vehicle a month after it secured a production license from the Chinese government. Xpeng, in case you forgot, is one of the new players in the automotive market, often uh, well remembered by the fact that its first G3 model uh, was called a virtual Tesla copy, and that Tesla actually accused it of stealing the autopilot source code. Here are the specs of the P7 compared to the Model 3 made in China. The Xpeng P7 comes in three variants, long range, super long range and four wheel drive performance. Each comes in three editions, standard, smart and premium, where the variants determine the performance, uh, the three editions determine what kind of cool functions they get like Xpilot 2.5 or Xpilot 3.0, which is clearly a spin on autopilot. Acceleration is pretty good compared to what is available in the rest of the world, though most achieve it with way weaker motors, which is curious. Prices are certainly great, uh, so is the range, matching and beating Teslas. It's a noteworthy competitor. They might still be pretty far from BYD and also still aren't exactly really on NEO's level here, but they're certainly very promising.
Toyota RAV4 Prime sold out. The Toyota RAV4 Prime has been sold out for this year. The fact that Toyota was offering a PHEV model of the RAV4 was exciting, but to no surprise to us, Toyota was surprised to have any demand for it. So they ran out of supply. This year, the production for its home country was limited to 3,600 and was limited to 5,000 for the US in 2020. It took just a few weeks, but all of them are already sold out. Luckily, it seems that for 2021, they do have a larger production plan at 20,000, which is more, but probably still not enough. The question is whether the Suzuki variant of this vehicle, the new Suzuki Across, will also be as limited in production. This at this moment remains unknown. Lordstown Endurance Pickup the world of electric pickups is growing quite quickly. We talked about Ford's new F-150 in last week's news show. This week is a turn of the Lordstown Endurance, we'll show it in a moment. But this truck has really convinced me. At first I thought it was just going to be another wannabe, but the specs are really quite impressive and, you know, something else. First off, its purpose, the Tesla wants the Cybertruck to be something that appeals to everyone from the future. Appealing to those who want a pickup truck but don't necessarily need it for work, but still include some pretty good features for people who do need it for work. The new F-150 is aimed at comfort and luxury, aimed at the people that need it for work and at the same time still fill it with 21st century tech from a big screen to driver assistance features. Lordstown, they are pitching this vehicle as something that belongs in a fleet. Design-wise, I would say that this is exactly what everyone thought the Cybertruck would look like before the Cybertruck was actually released. You probably know about the renders that I'm talking about, but if not, I'm sure that this image should trigger that oh right moment. It looks sleek and futuristic, but not out of this world. Here's a quote from the CEO. Again, we're catering to a certain customer, commercial fleet customers. So we don't have a leather seat option and things like that. So we could focus just on let's make this a functional work truck that gets the equivalent of 75 miles per gallon. Interesting. But you might be wondering, what is it that had me convinced that this is something interesting and not just a wannabe? I would say that this part of their website, it would have to be their in-wheel motors. I have heard of the concept before, but this is the first time I am seeing it in an actual product implementation. On one hand, I am slightly worried that this will decrease the available power per motor, but on the other hand, many electric vehicles have four-wheel drive, but none have four motors. Even the Cybertruck top of the line will only have three motors. Tesla prides itself that its electric vehicles have more grip on icy roads than regular uh, internal combustion engine counterparts because they can literally adjust the wheel a little bit every millisecond rather than have a small reaction every second. However, this vehicle ought to do that even better than a Tesla because it has four individual motors, one at each wheel. Now, like I said, this vehicle is meant to be bought by fleets. And my initial reaction was, that's funny, little startup. How are you planning on servicing all these vehicles throughout the entire country? Then I realized, if you take off the wheel and put another one in place, you basically solve the one technical issue you could have. Other issues like paint scratch or window replacement is not an issue for a fleet. Also, you gotta realize, a fleet, they will have spares, so they won't have the exact same issue that a regular person would have if they wanted to service their vehicle. Then on their website, if you look at this scroll animation, it seems the body is mounted on the skate rather easily. Something that is easy to take off and replace, uh, maybe even swap the skate for a newer model some years from now. Then we finally get to the specs. They are still secretive about the battery size or who makes the battery, though with Tesla you could arguably say the exact same thing. The range does certainly seem to match the single motor Cybertruck, and the acceleration between uh, is somewhere between the single and dual motor Cybertrucks. Tone capacity also uh, same as a single motor Cybertruck. We know that the Cybertruck can power power tools, but how much power remains a bit of a mystery. Lordtown says 30 amps, which uh, should be around 3.2 kilowatt, although Ford's new F-150 offers as much as 7.2 kilowatt. The price is more expensive than the dual motor Cybertruck, but once you add the US tax incentive, it's suddenly uh, right in between the two models. The specs are very interesting. Also, in case you were curious about the interior, this is what it should look like. Not too shabby. Citroën, three new EVs. Citroën, 
quite recently announced two, arguably three, new electric vehicles. Though it wasn't this week, it seems this news slightly slipped past our radar, but it is still pretty recent. First is the new EC4. It has a 100 kilowatt electric motor, a very standard range of 350 kilometers, a maximum speed of 150 kilometers per hour, acceleration of uh, 9.7 seconds, the battery is 50 kilowatt hour, and can charge at speeds up to 100 kilowatt DC and 11 kilowatt AC. The cost for now remains unknown, but it will be launched in the second half of 2020. It's not a compliance vehicle, but it's not impressive by any means. Though if the price is very low, uh, like as low as a Renault Zoe, so between 30, 30 to 35,000 euros, then it could still be an enticing offer. Until we have the price, we don't really have a full picture, but people are expecting a price somewhere around 40,000. Then the other two electric vehicles are the eSpace Tour and the eJumpy. One is for passengers, the other is for cargo, but other than that, they are practically identical. You can choose between a 50 or a 75 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, one has 230 kilometers of range and the other gives you 330 kilometers of range. It has a 100 kilowatt electric motor, a maximum speed of 130 kilometers per hour, and they don't list acceleration, but it's definitely slower than the 9.7 seconds of the EC4, probably around 12 seconds. It does not come standard with an 11 kilowatt hour charger like the EC4. That is an option, but 7.4 kilowatt is standard. One thing is for certain, they might not have a lot of range, but in general, the market for electric vans is becoming a lot more crowded. European EV sales. Then as a final quick story, we have the European sales figures for EVs in May. I already mentioned earlier, the low price of the Zoe is quite enticing, and so it is selling quite well. The Volkswagen Golf sales are strong too, now that they're on discount. It's surprising to find the Audi e-tron so high on the list, considering it costs so much more, much more than the Model 3. The rest is all pretty predictable. Our author Martin, he actually has a Renault Zoe, and this week he wrote a pretty interesting piece about the vehicle's success on Kuntechnica.com. Uh, the link is down in the first comment below, you might want to read it. Now here's the overview from January till May, and you see that the Model 3 and the Renault Zoe are neck on neck. As long as COVID doesn't interfere, there's a good chance that the Model 3 will overtake the Zoe, but I guess we will have to see. Then if you were wondering how the D&E segments were doing, since we didn't see the Model S, the Taycan, the I-Pace or the EQC on the list, well, here they are. Sales are not that big compared to the Audi e-tron and the Model 3, but for how much they cost, that is not surprising. Though the e-tron sales definitely caught me off guard, I'm gonna have to look into that. And now, this next bit, it's not exactly part of this new story, but this week Tesla also announced their uh, sales for Q2. Here in these numbers, we see that this quarter they did have less production, but they did have more deliveries than in the previous quarter. I'm gonna need some time with these numbers to, uh, you know, sift through them, see how to affect Tesla and really come to any useful conclusions. So that'll probably be part of uh, next week's new show. But, you know, in case you haven't seen the numbers yet, I thought I should show them anyways, just in case. Because that was it for this week's new show. And we hope you guys liked it. And if you did, please consider sharing it uh, with your friends that care about clean tech. And also giving this video a thumbs up would really help us along. Uh, also, everything that we cover in the new show, we try to write articles about and often in much greater depth than we can cover in the new show. So you might want to take a look at those. Uh, the links to them are in the first comment down below. Other than that, I wish you guys a wonderful weekend. Till next time. See ya.